Hi, and welcome. I'm Steve Martorano, and this is The Behavioral Corner. You're invited to hang with us as we discuss the ways we live today, the choices we make, the things we do, and how they affect our health and well-being. So you're on the corner, The Behavioral Corner. Please, hang around a while. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Behavioral Corner. I should have the lights dim in here because we're going to be talking about movies. We should be sitting in the dark when we do that. My name is Steve Martirano. We hang here and we talk about everything because everything, as it turns out, ultimately affects our behavioral health. And uh, therein lies uh, the reason I get to do this. So it's a, a wonderful, a wonderful time. Made all possible, of course, by our great partners, Retreat Behavioral Health. They not only provide uh, uh, spiritual and financial help to get this to get this podcast done, but they uh, are a great resource for talented people who know what they're talking about, which is rare in this culture. So hang around. I hope you will. We got a good one for you. Another in a series of my, I got to be honest, my favorite, my favorite thing that we do in the corner, it's the movie Mavens movie review, where we look at uh, Hollywood and television and all that stuff and how they depict substance abuse disorder and mental health issues and both. Uh, with an eye towards going, well, that's a good movie, but it's not the truth. Or that was a terrible yeah. movie, and it wasn't the truth. Uh, and we try to get a little closer to what these, what Hollywood is telling us about something our guests know intimately. And they are Maggie Hood and Grace Schober. They are the movie mavens. And we uh, welcome you back to the corner. Hi, ladies. Hi. 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 Everybody well, I hope. That's good. Oh, Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we got another movie to review, and uh, you know the way the way we like to do it is, you know, we, we look around, and if anybody has a suggestion, then we go for it. So uh, the, the ladies put their minds together, and they came up with something called Body Brokers. Body Brokers. I was not familiar with this film, so thank you, uh, girls, for pointing this out to me. Uh, I will begin, and I will begin with the description uh, that's on IM. It's IMD uh, page, IMDb page, uh, page, and you'll get an idea of what we're talking about. And I'm going to do it verbatim, so you know that these are not my, my words, all right? Here's the way the film is described that we will be reviewing. Brought to Los Angeles for treatment, a recovering junkie who uh, soon learns that the rehab center is not about helping people, but it's a cover for a multi-billion dollar fraud operation that enlists addicts to recruit other addicts. Doodly doodly do do do. Okay, so that's the movie, uh, ladies. Uh, fire away, uh, Mag. What'd you think? Yeah. So I, so at first I thought maybe the movie was like, ba- if not like totally, totally based on a true story, but that is true. I mean, there's a lot of things about California and Florida and marketers for treatment centers, um, and so. I, a lot of the things that they talked about or that you saw in the movie were true. Like, and that's really unfortunate. I mean, it's true even up until a couple, a couple of years ago, true, even that it probably is still happening in some places. Um, uh, As soon as people found out that they could make a buck off of people who were suffering and struggling, um, you know, it was the amount of money that comes as like, uh, you know, being paid to these places is ridiculous. Um, so, you know, and just to kind of give the audience here a little bit of, of perspective. So if I own a treatment center and I want to take people at my treatment center, I want to charge their insurance and out of network insurance um, can get for PHP. Let's say they might get for PHP, which is five days a week, sometimes seven days a week. They may get two thousand dollars a day just for um, just for like a, a short period of the day that they are in treatment during the day. They also can get more money for urine tests. They also can get more money for um, uh, medication assisted treatment, etc. And so, the facility has has somebody come into treatment, and they'll say, "Hey, you know." Do you have any friends who also needs to come into this treatment center? And if you do have friends and you, you know, you bring friends, we'll pay you $500 to bring them also in. And to somebody who's like a struggling drug addict, $500 is like the most epic amount of money ever. Um, and Even so if you're not you know, a struggling drug addict, uh, it for me is the most epic amount of money ever. <laughs> also true, also true. But the price I think that gets paid to the you know is like yeah, you know it's a lot. When you don't care about yourself, like, 
you know, at well, all. It's, it's astonishing. Like, it's astonishing for someone like me who's never been in that situation to imagine a system where someone manages against great odds to find themselves in front of somebody at a treatment facility, right? I mean, that's a miracle, right? And they're sitting there, and in the middle of it, <laughs> they find out they can make $500 because if you know anybody else, of course you know, everybody you know is struggling, right? right? So you can give me $500. Now, t- trust, tell me if I'm wrong. At that moment, doesn't somebody in that situation begin fantasizing about how high, how high they can get on $500? Oh, yeah. So yeah. the whole thing becomes self-defeating in that moment. Yeah. Yeah. The, and the, the sad thing about making, so, you know, so does that happen? Yes. Does that still happen in some places? Absolutely. Um, you know, does it break, you know, it, but it also makes people want to avoid treatment overall. And like, the problem is, is that treatment is what actually does work for people. Yep. And so it's frustrating because, you know, obviously some of the things were, they were based off of experiences that this guy had had. Um, and so some of the things are definitely true, but it also like make like even for myself when I was watching it, like I was like, I don't even ever want to go back. Like I don't even it's it's terrible to even think that, you know, this happens, but it so does. I, my, here's a little bit of like something in my perspective is it's terrible, right? The whole thing's terrible. I get it. But at the same time, when I was in treatment. I was never like, and I went to California for treatment and the place that I went to got shut down for this exact thing. Okay. The Fed <laughs> rated them, everything else. But can I tell you how pissed I am that as somebody who had no money and was a struggling drug addict, that nobody offered me money. You know, <laughs> like it never happened True. to me. It never happened to me. People weren't like, oh, you do have somebody that, you know, and we'll give you 500 bucks. Nope. I was broke. And you have no idea that would have never happened to me. Um, although like all that is terrible though. So, um, you know, but yeah, absolutely. I think it definitely happened more back even like when I was getting sober and when like Mags was getting sober too and stuff like that, because that's just what it was like in Florida and California. Um, for sure. I'm sure it happened other places too, but that's just like, it's the, it's the, uh, endless irony of, of, uh, money. Yeah. Coming into any system mm-hmm. intended to do anything. Money, you know, I, Cindy Lauper said it best. Money changes everything. I mean, it just does. And it doesn't. Shouldn't, my problem with this film is that it focuses on the bad actors as though they are the norm rather than the exception. And they are the they are being run out of the business, not run out so much as just squeezed out because, you know, the truth of the matter is you can get treatment. There's money available, no, no matter what. You don't have to be selling each other <laughs> to uh, to get treatment. So they focus on the uh, bad actors here, and I have a bit of a problem with that. I want you to to address it because I would point out the, a, an article in the newspaper just yesterday, where the government has indicted 47 people, I forget Minnesota or somewhere, who they allege stole 47 million dollars. No, no, 400. $70 million in uh, pandemic food aid money that was supposed to go to children. I right. mean, when you, you, you turn, where's the money? Bad guys will show up. And certainly uh, with uh, substance abuse treatment, they were, and they were there not only in abundance, but early on, early on, they saw an opportunity. Uh, so Grace, so you're, what? first of all, let me ask you something. There are two sort of geographical locations that have these horrible reputations. Maggie said one's Florida, the other's California. Is it the climate that lures people there? Why did you, how'd you wind up in California, uh, Grace? I will plead the fifth on one thing of what, where, like who sent me there, but I got sent there and um, I was sent there from a treatment center because there was like recovery house out there. There was extended care. So there was like, not like, I don't know, Max, this isn't like happening quite as much like the extended care thing um, anymore. It was like another 30, 60 or 90 days of treatment, Um, but somewhere else that wasn't the place that you were at. So maybe like a small step down. It's not quite as like inpatient. It's more like PHP with housing type thing, which there is like a bunch of that around. Um, But I think that it used to be called like extended care or something like that. Um, Maybe it still is. I'm not totally sure. 
Um, but I was sent there and definitely the climate has something to do with it. I think, I mean, look, I mean, Florida is like always warm. California is always warm. There's no humidity there. So it's even better. Um, you're by the beaches. It's just like really like enticing, you know, to people like, Oh, you're going to be on the beach in Malibu, you know, like, that sounds pretty good to somebody who just was homeless on the streets of York and Reading not too long ago. Right. Well, I lived in Malibu. You're right. It is better than York, with all due respect to York. Um, let, and then and, and, and there's a sort of, uh, um, you know, in fact, the, the bad actors in this field, it's not like they, uh, they built the environment from the ground up. There were, there were no guardrails there. It was the Wild West. And then the affordable, again, the irony of the Affordable Care Act, which is a blessing. It's as close as we apparently are going to get to universal health care in this country for the moment anyway, opened the floodgates. And, and then they just went, well, this is a gold rush. Let's get in there and steal with both hands. Uh, a couple of items, though, that, uh, that, that we should address the film specifically. Michael Williams, the actor who plays Wood, the recruiter who brings a young protagonist in. Uh, the protagonist, incidentally, did you recognize him as Val Kilmer's son? That's I did not. Who, oh, my God. That's who he is. He's no. Val, Val Kilmer and, uh, and uh, Deb Deborah Wally, I forget huh. uh, their son. And uh, Michael Williams, a legendary character from The Wire, uh, are featured in the movie. But I, So we want to talk about this uh, a little bit from a uh, the weeds of the movie. Uh, t what, uh, talk about the the uh, characters, uh, I forget it, Utah, the young uh, substance abuser who decides he needs help, in spite of the fact his girlfriend wants nothing to do with it. He goes and gets a treatment. T tell us about the uh, portrayal of intake when he meets, I think her name is May, the young girl who, who is the first person he talks to uh, in uh, the treatment uh, facility. Did that ring true to you, uh, Grace? Uh, yeah, it did. And I, I, I have more of like a sense of humor, like dry sense of humor. I like to make jokes out of like everything, but like, first and foremost, the names bother me, the whole thing, the names bother me, Utah would, it's just ridiculous. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, I mean, it is pretty similar. I mean, they try and make you feel like really comfortable, you know, they're like, oh, this is, this is going to be good. And we're going to like help you through. So like the intake process really, I didn't, it's kind of, that is how it is, you know, like people are there, they're friendly, they're trying to help you out. I mean, there are some places that aren't friendly and, and try to help you out like that, like we're medical center. Um, but you know, it, it is what it is. Um, I, I don't think there's much that strays from that particular point. Uh, <laughs> thanks for this thing about the names. <laughs> That's a pet peeve of mine. They never explain why a kid from Cleveland is called Utah, but Ridiculous, no, yeah. it's a kind of, kind of cool name, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, uh, uh, the, the thing about thousands of dollars for drug testing, uh, yeah. you're, I mean, I remember they, they busted lots of people for, for, uh, for doing that. Is that, how prevalent is that, Mag? Oh, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> you, I, recovery houses were doing it. Recovery houses who, like, you know, can buy over-the-counter drug tests were charging people's insurance. Crazy. I mean... You know the amount of money that they were getting for urine tests and then they were giving multiple urine tests each week trying to say like that they were um you know random um you know but the problem is is that the families on the back end would get like the um verification of benefits or they would get like the you know an invoice and be like why are you doing so many drug tests um it's, it's just crazy, you know, like they would call it like a pea farm, these places, and they would just like test, you know, they wouldn't even like send it out really, I don't think, Grace, right? Like they would just test it right there, but then like get all this money for these, it, it's crazy. Yeah, places definitely would. I mean, I, it just, I don't know how they thought they wouldn't get caught. Like, first of all, like, it, like, let me just say like for Grace House, like it's out of our own pocket that we drug test people and it's not like all the time it's like once a week it's like maybe random um but yeah the people who are doing that are uh they're they're definitely just i just don't know how they get away with it it never even crossed our minds you know to do something like that 
Why would it cost two thousand dollars to begin with? Does anybody because have any they idea? Can charge, because they can charge. Because Yeah, they're able to charge that amount because all of a sudden insurance companies were, and it's great that they cover like treatment and like, you know, all that kind of stuff, inpatient and outpatient. Um, but they are able to bill this high amount, especially like Maggie said, if it's like out of network or, you know, something like that, or they don't, or even a place that doesn't take insurance, like a recovery house, they're able to charge that highest amount for like a drug test. We're uh, meeting again with the movie mavens, Maggie Hunt and Grace Schober. They, we take a look at uh, films that allege to be, uh, not alleged to be, are about substance abuse or mental health issues, and then kind of dismantle it, as you can see. The one the case in point is Body Brokers. Anybody interested in this should take a look at it, because it is an example, as, a, as the ladies both said, of uh, certainly what happens uh, negatively in this, in this arena, uh, but you also get a, a great opportunity to see a cheesy movie in operation. It looks right. You know, the people can act. It's not like they can't act, but they just wasn't a lot of thought put into this. Uh, anyway, the, uh, it's called The Body Brokers. I don't know. It's only a couple of years old, but it's, it's, not, it's not not worth looking at. Did you think, and I, now we get to the uh, nitty gritty here now, since it's an <laughs> indictment, not it's an indictment of uh, bad uh, treatment facilities who were only in it for money, but it focuses on their marketing efforts. It's not as though they set up shop and then people came and they ripped them off. The, the film depicts a war room. There's no other way to describe that call center uh, than uh, a war room, the kind of call centers you see in movies that indict Wall Street, you know, boiler rooms where they're pumping and yeah. dumping stock and, you know, bad places where people have no scruples and they're about ripping people off. You both have backgrounds in marketing as employees of, of retreat behavioral health. Uh, describe, tell me about that marketing room and that guy that they go in and talk to that, that scummy kid who's just delighting and lying to people. Yeah. That is, is that, does that have the ring of truth to it? So, I mean, yeah, I want, I want to say it doesn't, but it does, you know, I mean, I, it, I think the biggest thing that I took away from this was like, because there were some facilities that absolutely that they looked that way. And there were, and there are, but I also, you know, the more that I stay in marketing, the more that I realize that so does all of healthcare. So, so all, you know, in all of the different positions of healthcare, especially right now in this field, like there's marketing because it's such a competitive field. Um, and so like retreat has marketers because we want to be present at community events you know, because we don't even call ourselves really like marketers anymore. We'll call ourselves like a community relations representative because we want to go and be out in the community and we want to be, you know, we want to represent retreat at some of these things. We want to go to hospitals and talk about it because hospitals don't necessarily know what resources are out there for substance use disorder, even today in 2022. Um, but like the marketing field overall itself in places that are not an in-network provider, um, you know, they have, you can slap together a treatment program and get it approved approved by the Department of Drug and Alcohol Programs pretty quickly. And that's like embarrassing to say for those of us who like want to try to remain as ethical as possible. But I mean, the standards that uh, not necessarily Pennsylvania, because Pennsylvania is a little bit higher end in terms of like what they're going to expect. Yeah. But like in Florida, it's, you know, you'll have it right in a strip mall. It'll just be like an, an, an outpatient right in a strip mall and it gets approved and then you can start to build this insurance. So there's definitely there's definitely truth that's associated with it. And there's definitely call centers that are going to be like that because if you know that you as an employee take away the patients out of it completely, right? Take away the person and you know, you, ha you have to completely isolate yourself from the human being that you're working with. You're bringing in your business you know, let's say if it's an inpatient business, right? And you're bringing in thousands of dollars per day with a 30 day range of time. Like, you know, like, all right, like as an employee, if we're talking, let's say we're talking about, I don't know, cell phones. That's awesome that in sales that you're going to bring in that much, you know, you're going to generate that much income. You know what your your worth is like to an employee, to a place you, you recognize like, well, I'm bringing them this much money. That means I'm going to get paid this much money. But when you put a real live human being in it. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like selling. It's not like selling a cell phone. You're right. But the measurement, though, you're right. The measurement, how you are judged as a valuable employee is the same. Uh, it's the same, same. Uh, paradigm same. as if you were selling, you know, 
the same. Uh, cars. Yeah. Yep. Oh, she so generate. How much revenue are you generating? Right. Yeah, uh, that's what always struck me as as, as difficult. Now, uh, Grace, it would be a, a terrible. Uh, uh, it would be a tragedy if the good actors in this field. And listen, yeah, retreat pays the bills around here. But I've known these people a long time. I've seen what they do. These are the people that if they said we're not going to market because we don't want to be involved in that hustle, then it would be a tragedy because the public wouldn't know about the good people out there. Here's the ridiculous part. So we're in the business of helping people. First word, and so is like Grace House, Recovery House is every place. But the first word is business. We have to be able to keep the doors open. You know, like it's not that, you know, just because we have marketers and marketers are going out to like keep the word alive, actually be like a representative to like, I've known so many people that have needed to go to treatment and they can immediately, instead of like calling the 800 number and this and that, they could call Maggie, you know, and Maggie can be like, all right, let me help you with this, with the insurance and everything else. Cause it's a lot. Um, but you know, marketers and, and treatment centers, they get a bad rap, but it's like, some of them are bad. Look, it is what it is. There's bad recovery houses. There's bad treatment centers. There's bad cops. There's bad, whatever, you know, but there's more good than bad. So like when we have retreat, who has people out there spreading the word, being a direct line to somebody who needs treatment, um, cause treatment is vital we can't like turn our nose up at them. We have to keep the doors open somehow. Right. And like, yeah. We can't, and just like, you don't like the person who's listening to me right now. Okay. You don't go to work for free. Right. Like I, you can't go to work for free. You can't like go do things. Like if you open up a business, you're going to want money revenue. So you're going to go out and like market and put flyers out and be on TV, whatever, you know, it's not just because anybody who does that, doesn't mean that they're bad you know but what i will say is like the guy in the movie blanking on his name but he's like the main guy that like talks to wood he's like the big like you know ritzy guy whatever i had me laughing okay it had me laughing because i (laughs) like literally that's what like in my mind a body broker looks like with the gelled slicked up hair and like the you know jersey type it just had me laughing you know because i know people like that that kind of like look like that whatever um and and it was funny but um like it's not it's not it was not hard it's interesting they were all the uh, they didn't spend a lot of time fleshing out a lot of character development here but these people were uh representing of types and it they was easy were. to pick them out you're you're right that guy that guy should have had a neon sign over his head saying <laughs> i'm slimy <laughs> the movie itself is like a little bit cheesy i guess but at the same time like i mean they got the characters pretty down oh you yeah know? They're, they're, they are they're for sure real people um th- let me ask you you mentioned the recovery house they they went right over it they didn't they don't refer to that home where uh utah visits and wood visits to uh pay off the older woman who's running the place they don't characterize that as a sober living facility but that's pretty much what it was don't you think grace yeah i mean it was i mean the thing is like i guess good for that i mean we never did or accept like any type of like money compensation um you know from any treatment center um you know so if that's what they were doing it was just like one of those things that I was saying, like there are bad recovery houses that are in it for like the wrong reason. Um, but yeah, I would, I would definitely say that that's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's why uh, it's taken a long time for sober. And I know I'm asking you this because your family and you are intimately involved in uh, sober living facilities through, through your grace, grace house. Um, it's taken that, that aspect of recovery a long time to come out of the, uh, the shadow of these uh, these ideas. That's why people don't want them in their neighborhoods or worry about them being in their yeah. neighborhoods. Well, really- you, just, you just keep doing what you're doing and the proof is in the pudding, you know? So like over the last 11 years that we've been open and like literally almost as long as retreat, it happened right after retreat. Um, and just like retreat, there's been treatment centers that have popped up, okay? Retreat st- stood the test of time, right? It's been here. Uh, it hasn't gone anywhere. It's even open more places like Grace House. It's been here. It hasn't gone anywhere. And there's been recovery houses, open, close, open, close, open, close. Same with like, you know, treatment centers and retreat like stands still, you know, because they are doing it the way it's supposed to be done. Not saying that we don't make people don't make money. I mean, it's crazy to think that we should be, oh, just let everybody in for free. And that it's just not the way things work, mm-hmm. you know, no, absolutely. So people just like to have something to complain about. 
So in terms of, of, of people who, who uh, there's a couple of reasons I think uh, people uh, don't believe treatment uh, works. One is depictions of the worst characters in the field, uh, you know, sort of predominating. So people go, look, they're all scum, scummy people. And the other thing is that people, people believe it doesn't work. Oh, what are you talking about? They've, they've been in and out 14 times. It doesn't work. And I can't, and I've, you know, I've gotten to the point now where I go, no, you don't understand. The fact that they've been in treatment 14 times means it is working. At least they're not dead yet. Okay. It's working. It just, just they're just got to keep going. Uh, so it's, it, so a movie like this can, you know, can confuse you going, see, it doesn't work. That's the worst thing about it. I don't, I don't want to like jump in there and like say everything. Mags, I'm sure has like some things to say, but it's like impossible for me to sit here and not say what I want to say right now. No, go on. Um, here, it, no, it's impossible. Like I was like trying to like keep my mouth closed. And it's like opening anyway. Um, <laughs> literally. So the reason like love never got me sober. Right. They weren't like, I love you. Stop using drugs. And I stopped using drugs. Like, give me a break. Love doesn't get you sober. So that's why treatment centers and things like that exist. The only reason and I like, I would love to just like pound this into everybody's mind. The absolute only reason that treatment doesn't work, quote unquote, is because the patient isn't allowing it to work. Like every time that I went to treatment, I was like, I was like, oh, boo loving or like hanging out with clicks or like doing stuff I wasn't supposed to do, you know? And I got people like Maggie chasing me around with the big book, trying to get me to do what I'm supposed to do and I'm not doing it. So the last time that I go to treatment and I actually listen to what people like Maggie are saying, literally Maggie, not like just people like Maggie, but literally Maggie in treatment, <laughs> like trying to get me to do what I'm doing. And I finally do it at the end. I mean, the parents, loved ones, I get it. They want to blame everything else and everybody else. Like this didn't work for my loved one. You know, no, your loved one didn't work it. Cause my, what I literally do. And it just happened two days ago. I'm running around the campus trying to get people to come to a group. And I get people who are like, no, you know? So like, it's not the treatment center itself. It's the person who's in the treatment center that isn't allowing it to work. And people just don't want to accept the fact that their son or daughter is being the worst in treatment. I was going to say something else, but I'm trying to like censor my mouth. So like, they're just being the worst in treatment. It's not retreat's fault. It's not this other place's fault. It's your loved one. Yeah. You know, uh, Grace, you're going to just have to learn to speak up your, uh, speak your mind and quit beating around the bush here. Uh, <laughs> <you> <laughs> yeah. Know, we, we, uh, we appreciate it. Listen, that's why you're here and you can use any language you like. I do. This is the word podcasting here. We're out from under the tyranny of the government right. anyway right. Uh, <laughs> so you know this is beautiful I, because if, again from the outside you look at this and say it's a grotesque caricature and not true about uh, substance abuse from my perspective i would i would immediately think that because maggie and grace are very typical of the people i know who do this for a living and i go no no, no they're not like that this whole thing's bullshit this is all but well they show up and they go no it ain't steve Mm -hmm. it's a lot of this is on the level um the problem is uh you know the good people are in there trying to drive the bad people out and money corrupts everything yeah. so um this is why we love the mavens this is why i think you know i said this at the beginning of the series when i watch a, a, a courtroom drama and i love it i can't escape the notion that i'm not a lawyer i don't know if this is true or not mm -hmm. or that or when i see a doctor show i go oh this is terrific uh, I wonder what a doctor thinks of this. So we're done fooling around with these drug and alcohol movies. Over it. Uh, and we're going to get in there and go, no, this is nonsense or this is cool. So it's called The Body Brokers. If you're struggling with trying to get an idea in your head of what treatment's all about, go ahead and watch it. It's not a pretty Don't picture. watch it, actually. No, no don't. No, no, don't watch it. It's not a pretty, it's not a pretty, you might as well start at the bottom. Man, you might as well start at the bottom. It's not like, it's not well, like that. And at the, at the same time, it's a movie, you know, like the movie is not right. That's terrible. But I don't think that any time that I go to like France or wherever it is, like if I go there, that I'm going to be in a hostel that like cuts me to pieces. It just, there's like, <laughs> You know what I mean? Like it is a movie. Yes. So it's not like things like that don't happen. Certainly things like that happen, but not all the time. Like yeah. most of the time. No. Yeah. You know, when this thing leaped out at you as like, Hey, we're a movie when they killed the doctor. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It, it was yeah. like, that, that's yeah. completely extraneous. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's absolutely ridiculous, but let's kill the doctor. 
uh, you know, <laughs> okay, because he's a scumbag too. Let's kill him. And I went, okay. And then, of course, the end. And I wanted, I, I do want to leave with, I do want to leave with this. Uh, it shouldn't have surprised anybody that sat through this thing that the character of U12 was going to die. I mean, that's, you know, it was pretty set up. He was going to die. And, and he does. Uh, but the movie ends with the question, uh, uh, no, this is going to happen all over the country all the time, and you're not going to do anything about it. How does the story end? And they leave you with a pretty, gra- a pretty straightforward pronouncement that treatment, and I know Mag's, I know that Grace is going to go crazy, treatment facilities are not the answer. Only 12-step works. And that's the movie ends. And so I went, wow. I mean, that was pretty definitive. I don't have to agree with you. <laughs> How about you guys? Is that the only thing we're talking about here? A 12-step program? No, it goes hand in hand. You have like you have to have physical separation. Like back in like 1935, 1938, like things like that. They didn't really have treatment centers. They threw your ass in a mental hospital and they're like, talk to you later. You know what I mean? But then like that was still their treatment. It was their physical separation from the drug. And then they went on to do Alcoholics Anonymous and it was or not. And it wasn't there like in 19, you know, 38, like I was talking about. But they go and do a recovery program and then they're successful. Right. It just wasn't a nice treatment center at the time. It was a padded room. So now it's a nicer treatment center to give you that, you know, separation from the drugs and alcohol. And then coupled with the um, program, AA or NA, I I am old school when it comes to AA and NA. Like, I think those are the two that that you should do. You know, there are a whole bunch of programs out there. CA, this A, every kind of A. But like AA and NA are the ones that coupled with treatment are going to work. Mag, uh, let's end this. Uh, I think we're on a five-star system here now. I want to want, want you guys to grade the movie, Body Brokers. I think Mag, I think Maggie's going to say, "Don't go see." It. <laughs> I'm not giving it. Any, I'm not giving it any stars. Stay away from it. So we want you guys uh, to give it a, a star rating. I know it's uh, a stupid way of doing this, but why not? We're going to do it. How many stars do you give it out of five, Mag? Out of five, probably two. Okay, two star from from uh, Maggie Hunt. And, uh, and Grace, how do you feel about body brokers? Yeah, I would say two. Okay. All right. So again, I, you know, and I don't get the, I don't get the score here, but I, I agree with those scores because I would tell people that if you want to see uh, well-made stories about this situation, there are far better examples mm-hmm. than this, than this movie, yeah. uh, far yeah. better, way better examples of this whole situation and, and not, sugar-coated examples, real examples. Um, Dope Sick was a brilliant job of showing you how yeah. things can get out of control, but it was honest and real. And this is, uh, you know, this is pretty cheesy. But anyway, uh, it's always fun talking to you guys. <laughs> you are the best. Again, I'm dedicated to making both of you superstars uh, <laughs> as movie as movie critics. So thank you all for your, for your uh, ladies, for your time and for you guys uh, hanging on the corner. You know, I tell you this every week, uh, you know, you know, you're supposed to like us and do all that stuff. It's great. But we also want you to subscribe to the podcast so you can, you know, hear this. By the way, a little preview. We may do the same thing with, with someone else reviewing it, but with music, but a breakdown music um, uh, that people uh, uh, ha- experience when they were using and how they relate to it now and whether, you know, it's a trigger and all that. So we're going to do a couple of these. Uh, Maggie Hunt, Grace Schober, thanks so much, guys. It is a pleasure. Most fun of the week. Adios. Thanks, guys. Retreat Behavioral Health has proudly been serving the community for over 10 years. Here at Retreat, we believe in the power of connection and quality care. We offer comprehensive, holistic, and compassionate treatment from industry-leading experts. Call 855-802-6600 or visit us at www.retreatbehavioralhealth.com to begin your journey today. That's it for now. And make us a habit, hanging out at the Behavioral Corner. And when we're not hanging, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter on the Behavioral Corner.